not in ourselves, but by the power of thy spirit, thy word. You know just exactly tonight, Lord, just what we need. And therefore, let your word have free course and be glorified. Glorify thy name. Everything that's said and done, redound to your glory and honor. We be careful to give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We say greetings tonight, everyone, in the name of the Lord. And we'll turn again to Ephesians, the first chapter, for just a little while here. You know, we've been talking about our riches. And the more I talk about my riches in Christ Jesus and begin to appropriate my riches in Christ Jesus, I'm going to tell you I feel mighty rich. <laughs> Not in myself, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that verse there, that third verse, which is the outstanding verse and the key verse, not only of, in the, of the book of Ephesians, but also of our salvation. Blessed be the Lord God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Then we talked about, uh, at about ten different uh, uh, items there, relative to the security and relative to the resources uh, in the bank, and Jesus Christ was the bank, you know. Then we talked about being a chosen even before the foundation of the world. We might be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children to Jesus Christ. And that was all that was all because of his his good pleasure. All because of his good pleasure. And then we were accepted in the beloved, and then we were redeemed from all sin, and then we were made abounding uh, uh, with, the, uh, with, with the wisdom and, and the prudence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we found out it looks like that everything's in the hands of the devil today. But we found out that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he's going to gather together in one, all in himself, both in heaven and on earth, even in him. And then we talked about our, we talked all about our inheritance and how that we had had received the spirit and that was the spirit of the inheritance and brought us and sealed us with that spirit until the day of redemption. So we talked all about our riches and we were talking all about the fact that we were in Christ Jesus. That is very, very important. And now, I want to turn with, want you to turn with me over the first chapter of the book of Colossians. And we're going to start reading with the 25th verse. Whereof I was made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me, for you, behold the word of God, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches. Oh, this is a rich mystery. And the glory of this mystery, which is among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we see in Ephesians, we're in Christ Jesus, and now Christ Jesus is in us. And Jesus said, I am in the Father, and the Father in, is in me. So you see, we are in the exact position that the Lord Jesus Christ had. He was in the Father, which was the Spirit of God, of course, and the Spirit of God was in him. Now we are in Christ taken out of Adam, in Christ, and Christ is in us. And now we notice this 28th verse here. Whom we preach, warning every man, and that means women too, and teaching every man in all wisdom, 
that we may present every man perfect, what? Perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul, do you mean to tell me that everyone that has the Holy Ghost is to be perfect? Well, if that's not what he says, then I don't understand the English language. And I'm reminded that Jesus there, about the one-third of the Sermon on the Mount, the conclusion of it, fifth chapter there in 548, says, Be ye perfect. Even as or just like your Father in heaven is perfect. God's ultimate purpose is that we might be just like him. And he has given us his spirit for that purpose. But now notice here. This is the road to perfection. Whom we preach. And the very first thing in this road to perfection is warning. Paying attention to the warning. My subject tonight is warning. Avoid the danger zone. Warning. Avoid the danger zone. In the year of 1912, the White Star Line, which is a shipbuilding company, had just finished one of the outstanding ships, the greatest ship that was ever produced at that time. It was 900 feet long, quite a few stories high, had two bottoms, had about 16 watertight compartments and was pronounced unsinkable. It was the 10th of April, 1912. I was about 16 or 17 years old at that time. And I knew all about it. And it was called the Titanic. And it started out on its maiden voyage from Southampton, England, the 10th day of April, 1912, went over to Ireland, took on a few more passengers, and there were 2,200 people on board that ship. It was a palatial ship. Everything on that ship, there were all kinds of things supplied for the purpose of the pleasure of mankind. There were rich people on that ship. John Jacob Astor was on that ship. And there was 2,200 people on board that ship. Ten day to four days, however. Four days after that, on Sunday morning, there came over the wireless, which they used, of course, for communication at that time. There came over the wireless from the corona. A message. And they said it is reported that ships going west in the course that you are in, that you will run into an ice field. And there will be icebergs there. They sent that message there to warn them that they might turn from the course in which they were in. Because they were headed for disaster. In other words... Avoid the danger zone. But they didn't do it. Captain L.J. Smith paid absolutely no attention to that warning. And then in the afternoon, Ship Baltic also sent a message over the wireless warning them that if they continued on in that course that they were in, they were headed for the danger zone. They were headed for an ice field. They were headed for icebergs. Captain L.J. Smith read it. Mr. Imsley, who happened to be the one who owned the White Star Line that had made the ship, happened to be on that board that ship too. And so he handed the notice to him, and he read it, and stuck it in his pocket, and that's as far as it went. Another warning 
came from another ship concerning the fact that they were on a course that was going to be very disastrous and they better change their course. But they paid absolutely no attention to it. He was working, he was working on his accounts and he paid no attention to it whatsoever, hardly went to the bridge. After about 10 o'clock at night, the California was about 10 miles from the Titanic. There was a man on the California wireless by the name of Clint Evans. And he sent a message over to the Titanic, and he was just about ready to warn them when Jack Phillips, who happened to be the one who was the operator on the Titanic at that time, here's the answer that Clint Evans got. Shut up! Shut up! I'm talking to Captain. You're messing up all my signals, all my mind. You're messing things up around here. That's the answer that Clint Evans got. So Clint Evans had a friend there in the wireless room called, his name was Charles Gross, and he understood wireless. And uh, so Clint Evans thought, my time's about up, I'm going to leave. And so he went, he, put, he turned everything over to Charles Gross because Charles Gross understood wireless and therefore he turned everything over to him. Uh, went down into the ship, but he failed to tell Charles Gross that the wireless on the California was a little bit different from the wireless on the rest of the boats. They had to wind up a clockwork in order to get the signal through. And he failed to tell Charles Gross the exact way to operate the wireless. Something is happening over on the Titanic. About midnight, they came into the ice field and began to realize they were in a danger zone. But then they began to realize it was about time to pay attention to the warnings. And so there was a man in the crow's nest by the name of Frederick Fleet. And uh, in this palatial ship, they did not give that man binoculars. And they told him to watch out for icebergs. And all he depended upon was his own eyesight. He's sitting there in that crow's nest, and all of a sudden, he sees an object. And he realizes that that object is an iceberg. Picks up the telephone, rings the bell, begins to talk to the, to the bridge. What did you see? I saw an iceberg, sir, and it's just ahead of us. Thank you. Immediately, they told the first officer, he said, reverse the engines. Turn the boat. You should have turned it a long time before that. Make a long story short, they had seven different warnings and never paid attention to any of them. Now they're beginning to realize they better do something. And so he said, reverse the engines. Turn the boat. You don't turn a boat 900 feet long. That's almost three ordinary blocks in, in a city. Did you know that? 900 feet long. You don't turn a boat like, like you would turn a, a boat 30 or 40 feet long. It takes a little time to turn a boat nine feet long. And I can just see. Oh. I can just see Frederick Fleet. Sitting in that crow's nest, seeing that iceberg coming closer and closer and closer. And then he begins to see the boat is starting to turn. And finally it turned. And they thought they had cleared the iceberg. It wasn't but a few minutes. There was a little jolt. And it didn't do very much, seemed to be very much. Just rattled the silverware a little bit in the dining room. But uh, Captain L.J. Smith was standing there, and he said to the first officer, he said, What was that? He said, It was the iceberg, sir. I gave the orders to reverse the engines and to turn the boat, but it was 
just too close. They had waited too long to pay attention to the warning that they had received. And they had come into the very place that they were warned to turn the boat and stay away from it. Avoid the danger zone. Have nothing to do with it. Turn away from it. And Captain L.J. Smith thought, well, perhaps the ship had just merely touched the iceberg a little bit because there wasn't just much commotion or anything. As I said, just rattled the silverware a little bit in the dining room. So I never done anything for about 25 minutes. But after about 25 minutes, he decided, well, maybe I better go down and investigate, see what's happened. And so he and the first mate went down to the bottom of the ship and to their horror, they saw a great gash in the side of that ship and the seawater was coming in. Went up on deck, they unloosed the lifeboats. Had 16 large lifeboats, four rubber rafts to accommodate 2,200 people. There was only, it could only accommodate 1,100 people. The order was women and children first, and the rest of the people, 1,100 people, mostly the husbands of the wives that were out there in the boats, was still on board that ship that the water was coming in to the bottom of that ship. The SOS was sent out by wireless. We're in distress. Help us. The California was 10 miles away. They could have come over and have taken everybody off of that Titanic, but Clint Evans had failed to tell Charles Gross the exact way to operate that wireless, and they had to, as I said, wind up a clockwork and he did not tell Charles Gross that. And Charles Gross simply picked up the, and listened and uh, picked up the, the, uh, the uh, well, well, you know what I'm talking about. And listened, <laughs> and he could hear nothing. The phone, ear phones. And he put them down on the table again and thought there was nothing coming through. But at the same time, the SOS stress signal was going out from the Titanic. Ten miles away, a ship that could have taken all the people off that boat knew nothing about what was happening. There was another ship, the Carpatha. They got the signal, but they were quite a ways away. And they said, we're coming to your rescue. And they could only go about four, at 14 knots an hour. Now the the uh, Titanic was 22. But finally, they got it up to 17 knots, and they said, we're coming to your rescue. We're going to, we're coming. And they kept on with that uh, notice there that they were coming, but they were quite a ways away. And at 2 o'clock, Carpathia had not yet arrived. I can imagine how those wives out there in those boats Oh, there must have been a screaming. There must have been a crying. There must have been tears because they saw that a Titanic was beginning to list. And in a short time, that boat went down 13,000 feet to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean with 12, with about 1,100 people on it because L.J. Smith had not paid attention to the seven different warnings that were given him. And because that Clint Evans had not told Charles Gross how to operate that wireless, 1,100 people lost their lives. I want to tell you something tonight. It pays to pay attention to the warnings that God gives. And I'm thinking tonight that there are many people, I wish there were more people in here tonight. You know something? People are deceived. The devil's got people deceived tonight. 
You should come to church unless you're so sick that you just can't come. I have stood behind a pulpit and preached sermons when I was sick. People are making all kind of excuses today to stay away from the house of God. And they don't realize what they're doing. The devil's got them deceived. They're headed for the danger zone. Did you hear what I said? The more I study the word, I see the necessity. I see that this way, this Christian way, is a very... Very, very narrow way. Turn with me to the seventh chapter of Matthew, 13th verse. We're going to see what the Lord says tonight. Seven, seven, Matthew 7, 7, 13. Enter in at the straight gate. That straight mean, that word straight means narrow. Oh, Brother Joan, when you preach, you're so narrow. You better be realizing that this way is a narrow way. Enter in at the straight gate. Oh, wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go thereat, because straight is the gate. Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You've got to look for what you find. I want to show you another scripture here. I believe it's in the fourth chapter of First Peter. When I read these scriptures, I realize that there's a whole lot of people, if I understand it right, that are allowing the devil to deceive them, and they're doing things and doing things and living such a life, that the devil has got a hold of them, and they're headed for danger zone. First Peter 4, 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous, oh, when I read this, if the righteous scarcely, where did he put that in there? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? I believe that it's time for many of God's people, perhaps they're not here, to realize that it's about time to get right with God and line up with the Word of God and do what the Word of God says. You know, John was quite bold. Mentioned in his first John there, he said, If a man says it is in the light and hates his brother, he's in darkness. He even said he's a murderer. And then he said, The man says that he it says it in the light and hates his brother. He's in darkness. He's a liar. In other words, what is John saying? If you say something... If you say you're going to do something, here's what I want to get to. If you say you want to do something and then don't do it, according to John, you're a liar. I love you. I feel like talking just exactly like God wants me to talk tonight. You want me to talk that way? I believe it's time that we, as a people of God, were waking up. I'm reminded. That there's a scripture over there in Romans 13 chapter <clears throat> 11 verse. And that knowing the time, oh, we <clears throat> as a people of God who have obeyed the gospel, we know the time. We know the time we're living in. We know that the stage is being set for the Antichrist. We know that the coming of the Lord is very near at hand. We know the time. We are responsible because we know it. The world don't know it. Therefore, they're living like they are in this world. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. All the time, worse and worse. I never realized it. I've said before. 
And I will be living at a time like this. But we know the time. Therefore, we are the ones that respond, are responsible. I heard a man one time and he said, I don't know whether I'm going to be ready when the Lord comes or not. He was a preacher who said that. I said, thought to myself, man, you better know whether you're going to be ready or not. Oh, my. After knowing, after knowing the time in which we're living, after knowing what's happening today, after knowing the fact that it's very near, the soon coming of the Lord, and not to pay attention to the Word of God, not to live according to what this Word of God says. Not to pay attention not only to the warnings, but also the entire Word of God. And pay no attention to it. To go on in our own way. I'm going to do as I want to do. I'm going to do as I please. That's the spirit of the world. Let me tell you something. The spirit of the world gets into the church. And knowing the time, that it's high time to awake out of sleep. You know, when a person is asleep, they don't know what's going on. I happened to hear about something one time. And there was a grandfather, and he was laying on the couch. He was asleep with his mouth open. And there was a granddaughter there, and uh, she saw him and her Mother had just purchased a nice basket of strawberries. And so she went and got one of those strawberries and went over and dropped it in the mouth of her grandfather. Ah! He was asleep. He didn't know what it was. Therefore, he did not want it. Many, many times, if a person is asleep spiritually, he don't want the things that God tells him about. He don't want the things that will build him up in the spirit and in the faith. He don't want the things that are spiritual. He wants his own way. He's asleep. Spiritual. That knowing the time. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation. He's talking about the coming of the Lord. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Oh, as the days go by, I think maybe the Lord will come today. He must come pretty soon. I don't see how I can wait much longer. This whole world is ripe for judgment, and not only that, the Antichrist is setting his stage. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not setting any dates. But I want to tell you, I believe the Lord's going to come mighty soon. And oh, what a tragedy. Far worse than to lose your life on the Titanic. Far worse than that. If you are not ready when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and you go through the tribulation, do you believe that you will still stand for the Lord? Would you give your life now if you had to do it for the Lord Jesus Christ? Huh? If you can't live for God, uh, it said if you can't run with a whip footman, how, what are you going to do when the horses turn loose? If you can't live for God when everything's going like it is and there's affluence and everything like that, if you can't live for God today, you certainly will not be able to live for God after the Lord take, it takes his church away. I'm serious tonight. I love you. I want to see everybody walk with God like they should. I want to see everybody appropriate the riches that God has for them. I want to see everybody yield themselves to God and allow the Spirit of God to control your entire life, your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. Oh, Brother Jones, that is an oh, yes, it is possible. I can show you a man that lived that kind of a life. And his name was the Apostle Paul. 
And I don't believe that the life that the Apostle Paul lived was an isolated life. I believe that you and I can live that very same kind of a life if we're willing to take the word of the Apostle Paul in his teaching, in his preaching, in his exhortation, and live like he says. Give ourselves to the Lord and allow the Lord to rule and reign in our life that we can live the same kind of a life. He said, oh, he said there in that first chapter there of Philippians. Philip, the, 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 the Philippians. I want God to be magnified in my life. That's what he said. And then he said, for me to live. 21st verse. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul, do you mean that when you're living, that Christ is living? That's exactly what he meant. I'm 20, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But yet he said after that, I don't live. Christ is the one that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to call your attention again tonight to Luke, the 8th chapter, and the 18th verse. Take heed. We're talking about warning, avoiding the danger zone. Take heed to your attitude. How do you hear? You know, I, I'm going to make a suggestion, just a little suggestion, that before you leave home, if you're really hungry and thirsting after righteousness, if you really want to walk with God, if you really want to be what God wants you to be, when, when before you leave home, you pray and say, Now, Lord Jesus, I'm going to church and I'm hungry. I want to be fed. I want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be a consistent Christian. I want to live for God. I want to please God. I want to live kind of a way that the Lord wants me to live, and I want to know about it. And when I go to church tonight and I hear the Word of God, I want to be in the right kind of an attitude. I want to take heed how I hear. I want to hear with the, with the thought in my mind that I want to know. And I'm going to obey what you tell me through your word, through preaching tonight. I'm ready for that. And I want to, to receive that which will enable me to make me grow in the Lord. Oh, and then you come to church. And you hear the word of God. And your heart is open. And you're ready. You're ready to receive what God has for you. And you find that you will grow in grace. And in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take heed how you hear. Jesus spoke these words. After he had given the parable of the sower, he said some seeds, talking about the word of God, some seeds fell by the wayside. Wayside is ground that has been walked over. And as that seed which had the potential of 100% fruitage in the ground, on the, on the ground by the wayside, the fowls of the air, which were interpreted as evil spirits, birds, swoop down, pick up that seed, and it brings forth no fruit. In fact, they're not even saved. They don't, they don't even obey the word of God at all. That's the hard heart. Then he said, some seeds fall among the rocks or on, on, in the rocky, rocky ground. Now, that don't mean it's all rocks. That means that there's some soil there, but there's never been a depth, never been a depth of going down deep and breaking up that, breaking up your heart before the Lord. Oh, 
got one's broken heart. Breaking up your heart before the Lord and allowing him to, uh, allowing that seed to go down into the very depths of your heart. Where the evil spirits cannot snatch it away. And that you are ready to obey the word of God. That the Lord Jesus might be glorified in your life. That he might be shown forth in your life. That his spirit might be seen by others through your life. And the way that you live. For you are not the one that's living it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ within you that's living it. But this is stony ground. Bring up real quick. You know, sometimes people are very promising. Oh, they've got a lot of zeal. Oh, they're going to do things for God. They're going to live for God. All of a sudden, there's no depth there in their life. And all of a sudden, instead of living for God, they do just exactly the opposite. They turn away from Him. Shallow heart. And He said, some seeds fell among thorns. Doesn't say that they fell and, and the thorns grew up says they fell among the thorns. That means that old nature, that old Adamic nature, that's in every one of us. And the seeds fell among those thorns, and those thorns grew up, and they choked the seed that had a 100% potential fruitage in it that brought forth absolutely no, no fruit. Hard heart, shallow heart, divided heart. But the interpretation was that the, through the lust of the flesh, riches, and the cares of this life were going to cause many people to lose out with God. About time people were taking the warnings, because if you continue on in the course you're in, if you're not in the course where you're yielded to God, if you're not in the course where God is ruling your life, If you're in the course where you're living for yourself, you're on the wrong course. And you better change your course. I remember that Brother Paul Price, the superintendent of California, oh, he preached a sermon one time. It was marvelous. I wish I'd have had a tape on that, but I I didn't. But he, he preached it. Sermon and his sermon was this, stirred but not changed. And oh, how often that happens. The word of God is preached. People are stirred. God talks to them. They're pricked in their hearts. And God's dealing with them. But they do not surrender themselves to God. They do not obey the word of God and they're not changed, and they just go on the same as they were. They're in the same course. Let me tell you something. That course is headed for disaster. Oh, I'm saying something tonight that's very solemn. I'm saying something tonight that should be very, 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 should be very important to you and to me also. We better be sure that we're in the right course and avoid and have nothing to do with the danger zone. Many people that are just living on the border edge between the world and the church. And the world is getting in many ways. We better be mighty careful that we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we care nothing, nothing for this old world. The world is going to pass away. And the lust thereof, they that do the will of God, is going to abide forever. Let us turn over here to the 11th chapter here of this same book of Luke. And the 35th verse. Oh, I feel. Well, Ukamasha of the Lord. 
tonight, the Lord's talking to us. We better pay attention to what the Lord has to say. 11.35 Take heed. Here's another warning. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Oh, as I read that scripture, I'm thinking that in my history, in the history of my own life, I've known men and also women that walked with God, maybe for quite a while, but something come up in their life, and instead of continuing on in walking in the light, they went back into darkness. I remember Brother Haywood one time. He was teaching there in the convention, 10-day conventions. He used to teach four hours in the afternoon with a blackboard and chart. And uh, he, he had been teaching on the new birth and the plan of salvation. Man lifted up his hands and said, Sir, could I ask you a question? Well, he would say, Yes, sir. said, if I don't do what you've been telling here, or teaching here, will I go to hell? You don't hear hell preached much nowadays. Years ago, they used to have preached hell a lot. There's not only a heaven, there's a hell. And if you let that, your light, if you get back into darkness after being in the light, you're on the wrong course. And you're headed for disaster. You're lost and lost forever. Unless you get light with God. Amen. Now, most preachers would have said, Yes, sir. If you don't do what I've been preaching, you're not baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and repent and baptize in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to hell. Most preachers say, Yeah, that's right. Brother, Brother Haywood didn't say that. But he would said, Brother, Jesus said, walk in the light. Yes, but I want to know whether I'm going to hell or not. Brother, Jesus said, walk in the light. Why do you have the light? I want to know. I want a definite answer. I want a specific answer. Brother, Jesus said, walk in the light. Why do you have the light? For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Man said, I see. I'm going to be baptized in Jesus' name. He was a wise man. But here we have a warning. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. I believe the words that the Apostle Paul penned to his son Timothy at the time of the valedictory when he had graduated from this world and was just about ready to depart. And he wrote to Timothy there in Timothy the fourth chapter. And he said, Preach the word! Be instant, in season, out of season, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come. Come, when they will not endure sound doctrines. Oh, the different churches, even in our Pentecostal churches, that people will not endure sound doctrines sometimes. When the Word of God is preached strongly, they won't do it. They can't endure it. And they'll go somewhere where there's an easy believe church. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll get along all right. And, yeah. The devil's got people deceived, and they're mighty deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And another thing, regarding, oh, there's so many today that are hearers of the word, and not doers. James said, if any man be a hearer, and not a doer, he deceives himself. Jesus there, after he had preached the Sermon on the Mount, the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew. He said, He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them 
is like a man that built his house upon the rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Luke says, regarding that, he said he dig deep, he dig deep, and built his house upon the rock. But if any man hears these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, is likened unto a foolish man that built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Oh, we should take heed to the way we hear in every time Never allow the word of God to be preached to us in vain. Never, never, never. We should be on our toes and drink in all the word of God and respond to it by obeying it. I want to re read another scripture tonight or so. I know all oh, the time it goes by so quick. I want Turn for you to turn to the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. 11th chapter of the book of Romans. And I'm reading the 21st verse. Paul is discussing here relative to the olive tree. And he says that the branches were broken off. He's talking about the Jews. And the Jews had failed God and the Jews had rejected Jesus and because of their rejection, you and I today are serving the Lord. We as Gentiles were grafted in. And now he's sending forth a warning to the Gentiles. Yeah, let's start from the, down here, from about the 16th verse. Or no, 18th verse. Boast not against the branch. For if thou boast, thou boastest not the root, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded for fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. And notice this one very carefully. 22nd verse. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. But toward thee, goodness, talking about the Gentiles. If, oh, notice this if, if, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Oh, what a warning there. Continue in his goodness. If not, you also will be cut off just the same as the Israelites were. But Paul said, I've kept the faith. I've run the race, finished my course, kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all, all them also that love his appearing. Paul hasn't got his yet. I'm going to get mine when he gets his, when the Lord comes. Then he says, do thy diligence to come unto me quickly. And then he says something that no doubt broke his heart. Something that caused him to really weep. He said, Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world, and is gone into Thessalonica. I read in Colossians 4 and 14, Lucas, Demas, greeteth thee, writing to the Colossians. I read also in Philemon, 24th verse, Aristarchus, Marcus, Lucas, and Demas, my fellow workers, Demas was with the Apostle Paul. Demas was one of the workers 
with the Apostle Paul. And now he writes to his son Timothy, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. I want to call your attention to another scripture, and I think that this is probably the last. <laughs> Hebrews, the second chapter. This is very, very important. <clears throat> Notice, first verse. Therefore, ye ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And I told you about that word for. When you see that word for, it means now that the Apostle Paul is going to explain the reason why he said before. I'm going to explain now the reason why I told you before. For. If, what did he say before? Therefore we ought to, be give, to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For. If the word spoken by angel was steadfast, and every transgression, and disobedience receive a just recompense of reward. Now notice this third verse. How shall we escape? He's talking about being in the rapture. Escape the things that are coming on this whole world. How shall we escape if we neglect our great salvation? I've heard preachers use this text and preachers are sinners. I'm not going to argue with them. That's not written to sinners. A sinner cannot neglect salvation. It's impossible for a sinner to neglect salvation. You've got to have something to neglect. He don't have anything to neglect. But you can neglect your salvation. You can neglect the grace of God in your life. You can neglect the being obedient to the Word of God. You can neglect paying Close heed to the Word of God. You can neglect being earnest, giving earnest heed to the things that you heard. And you can neglect the things of God. Farmer neglects his farm. He's got a farm. Man, businessman neglects his business. He's got his business. Sinner can't neglect God. He rejects God, but not neglects God. But you can. Oh, what a warning. What a warning. What a warning! How shall we escape if we neglect so great? Then he goes on to explain this salvation. So great salvation. Who's got the answer to that question? Anybody got the answer to that question? How are you going to escape? Who's got the answer? There is no answer. There is no answer. Jesus is coming soon. But these are the days of preparation. And he's getting his people ready for that great event. Oh, I said that great event. When Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. Are you looking for his coming? Oh. 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 Come on, Jesus. Take us out of this old sin-cursed, rotten, immoral, debauched world. Oh, hallelujah.